Well, I have noon, so we'll get started with our uh, pick meeting uh, for this month. Um, we are going to introduce you to NWA assessment data, and then we're going to give you an update on our International Baccalaureate Primary Years program. And from there, I will get out of the way, and I'll hand it over to Allison Cicinelli. Good afternoon. Um, do we have the PowerPoint? Is that up? Hey, we're excited here to talk with you about NWEA today. Uh, we're going to start with a little bit of context at the beginning as we pull the PowerPoint up um, and give you some of the information that we are, uh, have been working hard on in the background. That's okay. So I can set the stage just a little bit as we um, are, are in the process of pulling up the presentation. NWEA is one assessment in a bigger suite of assessments called a balance assessment system that we've been focusing on here at Midland Public Schools. And as a part of the continuous improvement process, we've been looking at, in one of our goal areas, a balanced assessment system. NWEA is one piece of that puzzle. It's an important piece of the puzzle, but it's not more important or less important than some of the other pieces. So as we um, kind of look up here, we have a quote that will be coming pretty soon once we get that, that pulled up. But when we're looking at data, it's important to not look at just one data point. It's important for us to look at multiple data points. Let's see if we can get it to go. Dave, can you flip to the next slide? Thanks. So as we're looking at multiple data points, we also know that we want to look at achievement data. We also look at demographic data, systems data, and we also look at perception data to help inform our continuous improvement process. So when we're looking at all of these data pieces, NWEA is an important component to our processes here. And we have spent a lot of time implementing it. It's new to us here at Midland Public Schools for uh, the context with which we're using it. Dave, can you go to the next slide? All right, go ahead and click through so that we have, there's three pieces, one more piece. Thank you, appreciate that. So when we're looking at NWEA, as we mentioned before, it's one piece of the bigger puzzle. NWEA, is the first time we're giving it this year in both math and reading in grades kindergarten through eighth grade. One of the cool pieces about NWEA is it's helping us have a common language for all of our teachers to be able to have some uh, great conversation in some of our collaborative structures. NWEA is given three times a year, once at the beginning, middle, and end of the year, which we call it benchmarks. We have been in the process over the past couple of years getting ready to implement NWEA. And right before school started, we did receive uh, uh, an expectation that we would be giving these benchmarks from the Michigan Department of Ed. It, so now these particular benchmarks are a requirement and an expectation, but Midland Public Schools was in a great position to implement these based on some of the work that we had done prior to this. NWEA is measured using a RIT score. One of the differences about using a RIT score is a RIT score has the same meaning across the grade levels. So a student who takes an assessment will receive RIT, which stands for a ROSH unit, and the score that they get, if they get the same score in fourth grade and in eighth grade, that score has the same meaning. When these scores are given three times a year, this gives us an indicator for measuring student growth. After we've given this assessment for multiple years in a row, we'll have great information and longitudinal data on individual students, but uh, aggregate data as well. Next one. Yep. A little bit of additional background. These assessments are norm referenced assessments, but one of the great things about this is they are tied to our Michigan state standards in both reading and math. When we're looking up and pulling student data, both at the individual level and at the classroom and grade band level and school and even district level, we can get information based on how well they are meeting or may or may not meet some of those state objectives. 
So with that said, that's a little bit of background on NWEA, what we've been using it for, and how we're, how we're gonna be um, using it within informing our bigger system. And then Anne is going to talk us through a little bit more of some of the details of what work we've done to get ready to be in this position. Is that working? I couldn't get it to work. Okay, go to the next slide, Dave. So like Allison said, we were already planning on this uh, rollout, especially at the elementary level. Uh, last year, we did some piloting in different classrooms um, between the grades of K-5, and then Jefferson has also previously used the assessment in some grade levels as well. So last year, we started hosting different workshops with teachers. We were meeting as grade levels going in and providing training on how to facilitate the assessment, um, how to pull reports, how to just navigate the system itself. Um, we've also provided individualized support to teachers. Uh, one of the cool things about using Google Meet a lot is that it's allowed us to connect with people and have them share their screen and for us to troubleshoot with them along the way too. So that's been kind of helpful. Last year, all of our administrators attended a workshop with NWEA facilitators they actually came on site and provided us a full day training on that information and the use of it at a building level. Uh, we also had another consultant come into one of our admin workshops um, this fall as well and talk more about using that data at a school level and supporting teachers in that um, data information and analysis. And then this year, as we've started to uh, provide this assessment and students have been completing it, we are now working on communicating with our families on the assessment results and what that information means. Um, so we have attached the NWEA Family Toolkit to our district website. We have recently recorded um, a video on interpreting the family report that we are going to get posted. And then also um, teachers have provided some information, I think in newsletters and such, on, on the assessment itself. Okay, uh, Jen is going to go over data. Next slide, please. So we are going to start by looking at some of our district reading data. Um, a few things I'd like to point out, the national norms you will see here um, on the pink line and then the MPS norms on blue. A few things about reading, uh, if you look in the bottom left hand corner you will notice that we do not have anything for kindergarten. We decided as a district that our kindergarten students would take MAP reading fluency, which is different from 1-8 taking MAP growth in reading. So we do not have the kindergarten scores on this. So you will see um, that the MPS line, um, well above the national line, you will notice a slight dip in the two at second grade. And to let you know, in second grade, that is the first year that students are reading the test on their own. In K-1, the test um, is read aloud to them using headphones. So that's interesting data for us to look at. So that is fall data that we have with MPS. Moving on to the next slide. Our winter data, again, mimics the national curve, um, except we do see somewhat of a dip beginning uh, in grade seven. Next slide. So uh, fall to winter comparison. Uh, the fall MPS scores are in blue. And, I'm sorry, fall MPS are in orange and the winter are in blue. You will notice the bump up in RIT from fall to winter begins to taper off um, as the grade levels increase. Next, we'll go ahead and look at math data. So in the fall, uh, we have a healthy gap in kindergarten. It begins to decline in first grade and quite significantly in second grade. As we move up in the grade levels, then we do start to see another healthy split in grade eight. Uh, just to let you know, this year we did implement in the elementary school a new Envisions 2020 math program. So that'll be interesting for us to look at trends over the next few years after we've had some time with that new curriculum piece. Next to math winter data. Uh, winter scores follow the same pattern um, as they did in math. Again, the gap decreases at about second grade, stays pretty close to that national norm, and then with a jump again in grade eight. And then finally, looking at math overall, uh, the winter bump tapers a bit, starting in uh, about grade four, it dips a little bit. 
So those are some general comparisons that we have MPS uh, with the national norms. As Anne is making the transition, one interesting thing to know about the norm data, the norm data is renormed about every five years. And these particular set of norms were created pre-COVID. And so all of the norms um, were, were established prior to uh, the testing. I know NWA has been doing some work in the background to determine what type of um, changes in the data may have occurred due to COVID. Just wanted to make sure we pointed that note out. Okay, next slide, please. This is another graphic that just really reinterprets the graphs that we previously have seen. Um, part of the extended um, continuity of learning plan that we have um, you know, going into this school year and state reporting, we have to uh, report our results on student growth. And so from the fall testing window to the current winter testing window that we just um, completed, this document shows our percentage of student, how many students, like the percentage of the student population growth from their fall to their winter testing. So this shows both reading and math. There is one area that does not have a score listed, and at the bottom you can see because um, it is less than 10, it's a, it doesn't report that out for confidentiality purposes. Okay, next slide. So how are we using this information? So part of having a robust MTSS system and having an efficient continuous improvement process is to have database decision making. So this information can be used in different levels. Uh, as part of school-wide building levels, I know that in um, some of our buildings that have used this in the past, they've been really taking a look at their class breakdown reports, at their building grade level reports. Um, one of the cool features is that there is a proficiency predictor for MSTEP. So of course, it's what are we using with that information or doing with that information. Um, if a student is not on track to be proficient, how is that helping us change our course of instruction? We're looking at common trends um, across the building, across the district. We can identify areas that may need supplemental support. At the grade level, our, especially at the K-3 level, our literacy specialists have been working with our individual teachers to uh, compare both their class reports to grade level uh, reports, and then how they're using that information to impact uh, whole group instruction and small group instruction. And then even at the individual level, uh, we have you know, targeted interventions that we can provide for students um, based on this information. And one of the cool things that um, we had a consultant come in and talk a little bit about was having you know, students take in agency on their own data and their own performance. And so one of the pieces that teachers are beginning to explore, beginning to explore is having those student conferences and having students um, graph that information to see their growth and take, take a part of that. Next slide. Okay, Mary is going to talk about the family report. Okay, okay so the family report is the report that uh, parents will be receiving from their child's school. And it's a one page report back to back, so it's pretty slick. And on the first page, at the top of the report, is just some general information about NWEA for parents. Um, as you move down, you see on the left are some, looks like graphs. Those are the achievement scores for, for math and reading. And then off to the right, uh, there is a graphic and that is the growth percentile. Next slide. So here's a close up at the charts. So as I said, on the left is the achievement score. The solid line is your students' RIT scores over time. The dotted line is the national norms over time. Uh, you'll notice they give you a percentile. This particular student has, is in the 47th percentile, which means he's scoring better than 47% of his peers across the nation. As you move off to the right, that is your growth score. Uh, this particular student Growth, growth score is in the blue range, which means he had high growth, and it means that he has grown more than his peers across the nation since the last test. Uh, next slide. And this is the back of the report. It just has some resource information. Um, 
more, more things that you could follow up, up with with NWEA. And it also gives you some sample questions so that you could start a conversation with your student's teacher. Next slide. All right, what questions might we have? Can you open? Uh, two questions. What, what does NWE stand, stand for? And, and second, can you talk about how it, is it, like, uh, it adapts to the students' answers as they go through the test? Absolutely. Uh, to answer your first question and help me out with this one, it used to stand for uh, Northwest, Northwest. North, Northwest Evaluation uh, Assessment, but they rebranded, and NWA now stands for NWEA. And so they removed the acronym pieces, uh, I believe, about two years ago. So that's, that's kind of the answer to your first one. So now they, they, they go by NWEA. Uh, everyone knows yeah. them as, as NWEA. Well, you... with Danny started mm -hmm. in the late 90s, kind mm -hmm. of small out of the Northwest Territory up in Oregon, and they've grown where they are the, the assessment test of choice for school districts throughout the nation. Mm -hmm. And not just the United States, yeah. mm -hmm. across countries. Uh, to your second question, uh, NWEA is a computer adaptive, sometimes used the acronym CAT test, which means when students answer a question, if they get the question correct, it will uh, increase the level of difficulty. If they get the question incorrect, then it will decrease the level of difficulty. And what the test is designed to do through their statistical analysis, I know they hire a lot of psychometricians, to get to a point where they bounce back and forth so they know exactly where that level is, where they land with their RIT score. So that's how the computer adaptiveness works. Typically, an assessment for middle school might run, uh, on average, about 55 minutes. Students who um, take their time might take a little bit longer. Students who answer the questions a little bit more quickly uh, might take them less time. Allison, maybe if you recall what RIT stands for? RIT stands for ROSH unit. Um, ROSH unit. Um, sometimes when we utilize the RIT score, um, we talked about RIT score um, standing for ready for teaching or ready for instruction. Ready for instruction today. Ready for instruction today. And so we, we use that as one of our indicators to know that we're teaching students right at the right level so that it's not too easy or too difficult. So. Allison, do you have a question? They would like to know if it's only math and reading. Pardon me? They would like to know if it's only math and reading. Uh, great. The question was, is this only for math and reading? And that's a great question. When you um, work with the typical NWA package, what comes with a traditional package is reading, language usage, and math. Right now, we're only utilizing it for reading and math. Um, the English language arts um, standards are divided up into reading and language usage. So between the two, NWA covers those. There is also a science assessment in NWA that we are not currently in the. We don't currently give that one. There are other different pieces of their suite of suite of assessments that we are using in kindergarten. I'm not sure, Jen, if you wanted to talk or say anything about um, the kindergarten fluency, but that's something also that is new for this year. Great question. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Would you like me to or do you yeah. want to? <laughs> All right, we are going to transition to the second part of our uh, session today together on the IB Primary Years Program in our elementary buildings. All right, we're ready to begin. Good afternoon, my name is Jen Service and I am the Elementary Curriculum and Instructional Specialist for MPS. And I am joined today by our two amazing PYP coordinators, Robin Harshman Rogers and Whitney Jacobs. We are here today to share our journey with IB. And also we are living right now in the moment of the evaluation process. And we will go into a little bit of detail with that. Next slide. 
So our journey to date, uh, we started embarking on our PYP journey way back in 2013. Um, and to give you a little bit of history on how far we've come, between the years of 2013 and 2015, uh, we were embarking on what we call our candidacy phase with IB. We broke the phase into two groups. We had our phase one schools and our phase two schools um, just to really get acclimated with the program. As far as what the candidate phase means is that we were um, assigned a um, representative from IB that came to every one of the elementary buildings, met with a coordinator and teachers, and really outlined what the program is all about to set us up to apply for candidacy. So between 13 and 15, all six of our schools went through that process. Between 15 and 17, um, we became authorized IB World Schools. Back in pre-COVID days, an authorization visit was in person. It was over the course of two days where IB evaluators visited each school building. Typically, that's between two and three visiting, visitors for the team. Uh, they would spend time not only with the coordinator, but they would spend time with grade level teams. They spent time with principals, with administrators, and really evaluated the program within the school. Um, happy to say that between 15 and 17, all six of our schools became authorized IB World Schools. After that, we were given a report, things we were doing great and things that we needed to work on or make improvements in. So between 17 and 19, we implemented the action plan, created those at the building level, had focus areas to work on, and we just really planned our program for growth. So now where we are today between 19 and 2021 is the self-study process. How have we done over the course of the last five years? What do we need to do better, make improvements on? And we are gearing up for the evaluation visit, which we'll go into a little bit of detail in a few minutes. Um, now that we're in COVID times, the evaluation visit will be full virtual visit. Next slide. Just to give you a little bit of context, um, currently there are 1,893 IB World Schools. 602 of those are PYP schools within the United States. 25 of those are PYP schools in Michigan. Six of those 25 are Midland Public Schools elementary buildings. That means that 25% of Michigan's IB World Schools offering the primary years program are our six elementary schools here in Midland Public, which includes the pre-primary center. Next up, I'd like to introduce Raman. And that's kind of That's kind of a really big deal for us to be 25% of Michigan's IB World Schools offering the PYP. Um, one of the things that we find as we ta start talking about PYP, especially in the community, is what is it? What, what are the components of it? I know that one of the things that I struggle with and sometimes still do is like when you're in the grocery store line and somebody says, what's your job? And I say, I'm a teacher. And then they'll say, what grades do you teach? I teach all of them. Well, what school do you teach at? Well, I teach at three of them. <laughs> well, how does that work? Well, I teach teachers, and then, you know, that's just, a, that's just an, one opportunity to make a connection with someone in the community. And I found that when we were talking about it within our buildings, there are so many facets that we all think are so important that we needed to really find a way, like, if we had a three-minute elevator conversation is what we called it, what would you say to somebody to explain the work that you do? And that's, that, that's a big task because there are lots of components and pieces of the PYP. Essentially, it's, I like to boil it down to it's a framework of best practice. And so this slide shows you what we did at, on opening PD is what is PYP. Kind of gave them the IB verbiage. And IB has its own language. So you have to learn how to decipher that. And then we took what were the big ideas from those um, and what would be talking points and highlights, and we bulleted them out for staff. 
And then we ask them within their grade level team to create, in your own words, what would you say? These can be places that you can have that conversation with someone new to the school, a parent when you're describing your um, parent at your parent night. It can be the grocery store line person or whomever. So to kind of give you an example, we have two here that some teams wrote. And what we did also was after they wrote these, we gave them back to them in, and it, we shared everyone's. So if you needed a blurb for um, the communique, if you needed a blurb for a newsletter, if you needed a blurb for just a talking point at a conference, you had a wide variety of things to talk about. So one example is IBPYP is a student-driven way of teaching and learning that's led by students' questions and inquiries. We work to develop internationally minded students through engaging lessons that focus on collaboration and conceptually based units of inquiry. PYP fosters student agency, which is voice, choice, and ownership, and exploring, questioning, and experimenting in their world. Those are pretty powerful things. Um, and you could, we could spend a whole day just talking about that one piece there. And another example is the primary years program is a school-wide system that promotes inquiry and 21st century thinking through engaging, hands-on, and student-driven units of inquiry. The, learner, the program promotes building global citizens through the learner profile attributes that students examine and strive to develop in themselves. They are encouraged to be risk-takers, well-balanced, open-minded, caring, reflective communicators, inquirers, knowledgeable, principled, and thinkers. And that last bit was are all the components of the IB Learner Profile, which is at the heart of all that we do in PYP. But it's also the part that transfers from PYP to MYP, which is the Middle Years Program, and then to the DP, which is what our community was more traditionally used to talking about was the DP program. And in the beginning, we did have some misconceptions of what does that look like at elementary versus the high school. And I, the biggest difference is it's for all students. So everyone in the elementary school is engaged in PYP, which is a really powerful thing. OK, next slide. So as I said, the learner profile is at the heart of the PYP. And there are 10 attributes. And really, I feel like IBPYP is a really amazing combination of what is the art and the science of teaching. You have all of the components, the inquiry best practices, which is the science. And then you have the art, which are the things that um, allow students to express themselves, become better people, we say. We strive to become more knowledgeable, that we have a common shared humanity, that we are internationally minded people. And when you say that, you think, oh, well, that means we're going to learn about Germany. Well, internationally minded doesn't mean it has to be across the ocean. It means it has to be on your world. So beyond you as a kindergartner, beyond you as your classroom, beyond you in your school, beyond you at your home, in your community. So all of those components make up being an internationally minded person. And those 10 attributes are goals. And we don't all possess them at the same time. And we're in varying places and different times in our lives, in our learning, and in our work. I'm still working on the balanced one. <laughs> um, and this all came, this work came the year I was born. And if I'll date myself a little bit. That was in 1971, so they just had their 50th year anniversary. And so these things have held true for the last 50 years, I think, because of the strong components of best practice and the beautiful way that it does combine the art and science of teaching. Okay. So this is another example of something that we asked our teachers to do. Um, an, a large component, and you even heard when we were talking about NWEA, about agency, which we defined in, in PYP as having voice, choice, and ownership. Another part is reflection. And as I was reading our examples of PYP, the part I think we missed in there that we'll have to review is that we didn't include teacher agency in there. And that is a huge component because it is not PYP. When I started, I was 
in phase one original and went to a conference and I had no idea what they had just told me. They were speaking a foreign language to me. So I'm a learner. I go looking for the manual, the binder. Where is it going to tell me what I need to do and how it works? And it isn't there. And at first, that can be frustrating, especially if you want to know how to do it. And we have a lot of amazing teachers who all want to do it right. And the thing with IB is that the agency lets you decide what is the best practice, not the best practice, but what works best for you within your classroom and your school. So having that kind of power to decide what kind of units you create, what are the components, what, are your, what is your focus, is a really powerful piece. And that is why, in the beginning, makes the teachers very angry that we all, at all the six schools, did not write the same planners and we just share them. And then I say to them, okay, so you want me to give you a planner and you want me to tell you this is what you're going to teach? Well, no. Okay, so you want to have a say in what you're creating? Well, yes. But, but, but I think as we wrote the units and we've written them and rewritten them, there's six units for every grade level. They're all under the same theme. And as we've worked over the last eight years with these units, part of the reflection of self-study for me was when we're looking back at things from 2015, as the coordinator, I was kind of even saying, let's just throw it in the box. Like, I mean, just, we'll just do the best we can now. We kept saying, we we'll do better when we, we can do better when we know more. And, and so we kind of went with that philosophy. And so reflecting as a 2020 planner to a 2015 planner, the growth is incredible in our teachers and what our understanding of PYP and in our students. Um, I think the agency is a really powerful piece that sometimes we overlook. And you'll hear that I think it's our new word in education. So for this piece, the digging deeper, Part of PYP also that is a strong piece is the self-assessment and goal setting for yourself. And so when we develop PYP PD, we always model what we want teachers to do within the classroom. It's always a purposeful activity that they can then take and apply in their classroom. So this was the place we asked teachers to walk the walk. So we're asking kids to do these things. We had These are all the strong pieces foundational pieces of PYP on here, like collaboration, concept-based teaching and learning, inquiry and questioning, strong transdisciplinary units of inquiry, relevant, significant, and challenging learning experiences, meaningful assessment of teaching and learning, approaches to learning, those are the skills that we use to learn, such as communication skills, research skills, and authentic connections to auxiliary classes, agency and action, and creating a culture of thinking. And we pulled these pieces from all of our reports. So we had six reports after our first uh, authorization and became IB World Schools. And we looked for commonalities. What were commonalities in areas that we needed to grow? So those growths are called recommendations. So these were the similarities because there are things that all PYP schools have to work on. So not only did we say, here, these are the things that we need to think about this year as we design units, work with students, make plans. But now look at this. Look at what you think you're strong at and choose two things that you really want to focus on because, as we know, there's overload to what we can take on. And so taking on two things for the year that are going to be your focus and your goal and then checking in as we work through the planners throughout the year. And I think that has been a powerful piece for them to not only talk it with their students, but then walk it. Yeah? I think, yeah, I think it's up to Whitney now. Thanks for laying the foundation, Dave. Is it okay if I move over here? Okay. All right, as Jen mentioned kind of at the beginning, our current um, place in the process, I guess, would be what we're in, which is now self-study and evaluation. So self-study, we started that journey last year, although it was greatly interrupted by COVID. But self-study is intended to be a year-long process. So we did start it last year. Um, and it has a couple goals. So one of them is reflection, looking back on the past four, five, six-ish years, depending on what school you were in, if you were in phase one or phase two and providing that opportunity for all the stakeholders to reflect. So not just the staff, but we're asking for input from our parents, from our students to say, 
here's where we started. What are we doing really well? What have we really grown? I feel like Robin, when she was talking about um, starting the program, we all really dove into the learner profiles because it was something we could grab a hold of and that we could you know, embrace with our students. And to look back as a teacher who was writing these planners with our coaches and our coordinators, to see how far them that we've come is really um, quite impressive. And then it's also looking back and celebrating and celebrating with, with IB and collectively to say, yes, we did focus on learner profiles and look at our units now. We started off with science and social studies, trying to in, embed those and make connections, but now we're embedding reading and writing and maybe we can pull some math elements and make all of those connections under some big concepts. So uh, that's, that's another thing that we've uh, appreciated looking back on. And then lastly, we know that we have areas for growth and this has been a process that has allowed us to see really when we're looking at the IB standards and practices, okay, we've fallen a little short, you know, maybe with ourselves and IB and we need to set some priorities and put some actions into place to grow those areas. Next slide. So here's just a visual of what our process has looked like. We started last year. Essentially, IB provides us with a questionnaire and it has all of the IB standards and practices listed. And what we are tasked to do with our staff, and again, we've brought in student, some student and parent components with this, but looking at each individual IB standard of practice and rating ourselves. So Robin, can you think of a standard and practice off the top of your head? She's the standard practice queen, so I'm gonna. Um, including diversity and inclusion into units of inclusion. Including diversity and inclusion into our unit planners. So the team that would be written for them, we've used a lot of um, Google Forms so that we can do a lot of this collection of data, if you will, um, virtually since we have had some um, restrictions due to COVID. And the team is going to then have to task themselves looking at their grade level or individually. Uh, could you click to slide, sorry, Ann, would you click to slide um, 10? Oh, right there, no, you were on it, sorry. So based on that standard, they had to provide their input. Did they feel like their team is emerging with that? And it goes all the way up to excelling. And then what we did as coordinators is once everybody provided their input, we gave an overall score and that went on the questionnaire, which was part of an application. Would you go back one, back, there we go. And we'll touch base on that in a minute, but basically um, how many standards and practices did, did our staff? About 62. About 62 standards and practices we had to rate ourselves on. Um, through the, the collecting of the evidence, we, or the collecting of the questionnaire data, we've had to, not only we're asking teachers to rate themselves, but then we're saying, okay, that's great. You feel like we're demonstrating on that standard. What evidence do we have to show that we're putting, uh, embracing DEI with our, within our unit of inquiry? So not only just saying, yes, we're doing really well or we're not doing so well, but what do we have to show that supports that? We, we've collected this, again it was, we started last year through grade level meetings, through some questionnaires, through interviews, and we submitted that to IB. For phase one schools, we submitted our applications and our questionnaires this past fall. So our phase one was Woodcrest, Adams, Plymouth, and Chestnut Hill. They will be having their um, IB team visits for their virtual visits this spring. So between March and May, we'll have four schools um, we'll have a visiting team from IB come, come virtually. And our phase two schools, which would be Central Park and Seabirt, we will be submitting our questionnaire and our applications this June with visits in the fall. After the visiting team comes, which we'll, we'll dive into the team visit in just a few minutes, they will provide us with a written report uh, to which we will have some commendations, some recommendations, and hopefully no matters to be addressed, but we will revise what we call our action plan, which just says, uh, here are our IB standards and practices, and this is what we've done so far, and this is what we implant, or plan to implement in the future to be able to make that growth. Next slide. 
uh, keep going. We threw this one in here. The, the premise of self-study and evaluation is really what they call an appreciative inquiry, which is not to so much focus on what we're not doing well, but instead what, celebrating what we are doing really well with the underlying um, notion that we do need to make changes to be able to grow as educators and as people. Uh, go ahead, Ann. Yeah, I would just add to that the reason we, we tried to to choose and find a quote or a way to explain the self-study and evaluation process. It's about more than just those PYP people are coming to check on us. So we need to make sure we're checking the boxes and doing all the things. Okay, you could look at it that way, but if you're really looking through a PYP IB lens, you're looking at growth over time. And that's one of the reasons we keep portfolios for all our students is because what is a better piece of evidence than to see a kindergarten reflection from a unit of inquiry about how we grow and change to a fifth grade reflection about infection detection or, or revolution or whatever and to see the progression of how have I changed as a learner? What do I know now that I didn't know? Mm -hmm. um, so to look at it as that inquiry piece which is the foundation of PYP and for teachers to kind of shift from just these people coming to let's look and reflect and find out what we can do better. And that I think sometimes we do feel like it's an I gotcha instead of that we are partnered with an organization who, who does value and support us with areas that we do need to grow. So it's more than checking boxes. Um, as we said, we do have our evaluation visits coming up. Our first one is Chestnut Hill. We will have, uh, I just learned that our team is made up of two people so far that will come uh, virtually for our evaluation visit. So when they come, it's again, appreciative inquiry as Robin just spoke to, really just being able to celebrate our strengths and our successes for our implementation over the past five years. And just a genuine curiosity of where they can support, what are we doing really well. Um, I don't know if I want to add anything more to that specific one. Um, I do want to talk about the, the state, all stakeholders too. I think this is a nice piece that this process, and, I, and Robin has more experience in this, but it feels sometimes like it's just general education teachers, but really it's, it should be our entire community. We are IB World Schools across six buildings. We, we have DP um, schools for our high schools. So it's been a nice piece where we can all ask ourselves what are our contributions been? How are we developing learner profile attributes in our students? How are we developing the skills um, that the IB lays out for us? Are our lessons inquiry based? Are we using the language that Robin talked about in our communiques? And are we showcasing that we are an IB world district almost, right, with the exception of our couple middle schools? So it's really been kind of refreshing to look at it through that lens. Um, and then the last part of the, the evaluation, and I'll talk about with that visit, what we think it's going to look like in a second, but. Um, is it's, it's given us some really clarity when we're taking and looking at all of those ratings and how we scored ourselves. It's become very clear where teachers are feeling like they need more support. So for Robin and I and Jen to be able to provide uh, professional development and be able to see that those holes in our program um, do exist and what, what we can do to make those better. Anything you want to add, Jen and Robin? Okay. Okay, some of these we just talked about. Self-study, like I said, that's kind of the process leading up to the evaluation. At the end of this year, all six of our applications will have been submitted. What they ask is that each coordinator, you submit three choices for when you would ideally like your visits to occur. I think we've kind of gotten our first choices-ish. We've tried to spread them out a little bit so that we're not all at the same time. Uh, Chestnut Hill will be in March. Plymouth will be in April and then uh, Woodcrest and Adams, their visits will be in May. The virtual submission, um, as part, since the visit is virtual, normally we would have three days where the visiting team 
is not only meeting with teachers and administrators, but they would be walking around and being able to see the culture of your building, if you will, looking at what's hanging in your classroom and talking with students, and that's not the case. And so to prepare for that this year, we've asked that teachers give a virtual journey of our of PYP through the last four to five years. And so this has been kind of some incredible work put on by teachers. This has been all on their own time, you know, with that combined with professional development to build what we call a virtual bulletin. And so they each team kind of took this on. They put in photographs. They've put in video clips of them teaching, their students engaging. And Anne, would you, we're just going to sh show an example of one grade level at one school, how they've showcase their journey. So this is a fifth grade team at Adams that um, Marianne Lepofsky and I, we talked about, I said I have this long document from IB. It tells me all these components I need to have for this virtual visit because when I did it the first time for authorization, I had my beautiful binders and everything was printed and I had all my communiques stuffed in there and all, it was and like, here, just, just look. just do a slow click through while Robin's kind of, is that okay? Yeah. Here's, a, here's my binder, but how am I going to do that when we're going through Zoom or how am I, I going to be able to show? So we came up with this virtual bulletin board idea and then made a template for everyone so that they could use it as is if, if that worked for them or make it their own. And so we asked them to put in images with captions. And so the, this is in progress. So um, these are some samples of student thinking. Um, showing charts, the thinking that goes in the classroom during the unit and teaching. Bulletin boards, this is one connected to where we come from, our identities, our heritage. And all, when you see those headers, those are the themes for the six transdisciplinary units that we teach. This is, um, they had to modify, they, in fifth grade they do um, some connection to the Holocaust and what that was like and being in a cattle car. And so usually they take them on the playground and they make, a, they make it the dimensions of what it really was and they stand in there. So obviously for protocols and safety, that's not possible. So with some creative thinking, we found some ways to take that activity and make it safe, appropriate, and still impactful for students. And the one thing I will say about that this year, you hear all the, but we can't, but we can't, but we can't. But what I'm starting to hear more in my meetings with teachers is, you know, even though we usually did it this way, because we couldn't do it that way, this way is actually really better. And that's a really powerful <laughs> forcing thing. Forcing some <laughs> Yeah, it's forcing some change. change. And, reflection, yeah. and some of that's been really positive change. Um, we ask for a lot of student reflection. Reflection is at the core and the heart, right alongside, I think, learner profile. Because if you're not reflecting, and trying to better your practice, you're not growing. So we ask, we ask students to do it all the time. And we honor who they are. We put in their things that they identify with. We make it about them, as many connections to them, so that they can go take those and journey in the world. So we won't take you through all these. I think some grade levels had as many as like 75 slides of things that they wanted to showcase. So which is really powerful. You can click a little, if you don't mind just clicking a little. So this, so connections to um, Project Lead the Way. Had to do that differently because this unit, pa patient zero, it's all about taking, <laughs> taking some secret gel in your hand and you're going to shake all these people's hands. Obviously not really able to do that, but what was the other side of that is they had real life happening that they could connect to. You can go back to the other slideshow, and I don't think we probably have time to. Yep. But just gives you an idea of what, what teams have put together. Our virtual visit will consist of a three-day visit. Um, we will be, they will meet with all of the grade level teams. They will meet with auxiliary teachers. They will meet with administrators at the district level and the building level. They will meet with parents during that time for that building. They will meet with a group of students. And we will even be doing live classroom visits, so they will be able to see teaching and learning in action via our cell phone or tablet, whatever we're using, while they're there as well. Just to you know, get a feel for, again, the culture of the building and what do the, our IB standards and practices look like at Chestnut Hill or at Adams in practice. And then lastly, 
Robin, you can just briefly about, we'll get a report back. Well, as having gone through it several times, um, you, at the end of the meeting, at the visit, you have like a sit down meeting and they don't tell you what's in the report, but with a listening ear, you can hear what was a positive, what is maybe going to be a recommendation and what might be problematic. So you kind of have that in your mind. But then in about, it just depends on the timing. We were, had our visits in March mm -hmm. and by the end of April, beginning of May, we had received a report back. So we're hopeful that even if we have a May visit, one at Adams, the last, the first time, we got it on the very last day of school. So it just depends, and they'll give us our feedback, tell us where we are in the process, and what we need to do moving forward. So uh, another th part that we've been tasked with this year is how can we combine DEI and SEL work into PYP? And for us, uh, it's just naturally part of what PYP is. And so... For this year, because things have been hard and we try to model, again, what we want our students to be doing, we ask teachers, because we have grade level meetings and part of grade level meetings is it's a time to reflect and it's not always great things. You know, sometimes these things bog us down and even find we found that in ourselves. And so how can we flip that and make it positive? So we ask everyone to choose a word of intention, something that you could reflect on throughout the year that could kind of ground you, um, tying in those DEI SEL pieces too. So if you go to the next slide. So we also, because we model, we use a thinking strategy to do it and we've kind of flipped it on them. So we asked them to choose a word. And so this is an example, her word is begin. And part of that thinking strategy is to choose a phrase from maybe a text, but we asked them to create it. So she, her phrase is small steps to bring new change. And then her sentence was, to begin, begin. And so we're taking those and we're posting them in our building so that not only are we honoring students' thinking, but we want students to see that we're doing the work too. And here's examples of our thinking. And so that, that I think that will grow our, our culture in that way. And the two pictures are examples. Whitney and I have our word. Our word is freedom. And we bought our bracelets from a company that's called Little Words Project. If you're interested in that, it's a very powerful thing. They register, so if I needed to give this bracelet to somebody who I thought needed some freedom, then you could track it across the world, which is very PYP-ish. <laughs> and here is, that's a, another example of someone who was inspired to find the exact bracelet she wanted with her word, which is grace. Some of them put them in frames in their classrooms, and so to see that take hold, and then it's a great thing to also say, remember, your words begin, so let's begin. Or I, we say to ourselves all the time, remember, freedom, nope, let's let that go. So these are the ways that we're kind of honoring teachers, their thinking, and, and modeling it for them to use with their students as well. So hopefully that gives you um, a small glimpse into our journey with PYP and um, to end with one of our favorite quotes. It is good to have an end to journey toward, but it is the journey that matters in the end. And what a journey this has been and we are excited for the future of MPS with PYP. Thank you and we'll take any questions if there are any. <laughs> so that is the middle years program, and we have explored that two or three times in our careers. Um, Mr. Jaster has been involved as a middle school principal, and it is very engineered, and Robin and Whitney weigh in if you have something I'm saying wrong, please. I, and, and, when you're okay. And we've had difficulty figuring out how it fits into the American system and maybe the mi middle and public system as well. So it, it may have the... Um, problem of shoving some of our uh, co-curricular activities uh, 
um, eliminating them or reducing them in the scope as well. And so we've not been able to figure out that piece of it. But I think the question Sudi's may be asking is the connection to IBPYP in the middle year so we don't lose that momentum to the high school. And, and again, I think we've done some things but are working on that maybe where you have a comment. Go ahead. And we, and we and along the process, have, you know, kind of partnered. And I know, you know, Dirk, who's the principal at Northeast, he, you know, he said, if I could do one thing to support that, what would that be? And I, making thinking visible strategies and routines. Because that's something that once they know them, they can use them from kindergarten until they're in 12th grade. And my famous example, my partners will hate to hear it, but I have two children. I have a senior and I have a freshman. And one of them is a PYP kid. And one of them is not. And the differences in how they think, how they problem solve, is incredibly different. So my children this year are doing hybrid. And so for my student who is non-PYP student, she is amazing at it. She can task through the task, go through. I know what I need to do. I've, I've done this in school. She's also had amazing teachers along the way, so not taking anything away from that. But my younger child, who's a freshman, she knows the skills, but what she's missing is the connections, the conversations, the things that she, so she's ready to take it to the conceptual level rather than the factual level, and that we don't always find that. And so there's just a difference in our kids who go through PYP, and it's, and I t try to tell people, I know there's that gap, and it, in a perfect world, it, there would be no gap. But what I can tell you is the skills and the thinking and the processes and all of the work that we do in elementary school, it does not disappear. It becomes part of who they are. And I think with that foundation with the Wonder Profile, inquiry, conceptual thinking, and then having them be in charge of their learning, I don't think it matters if they're a kindergarten or 12th grader. It still will carry. Hopefully we, that answered Sudi's question, but, um, you know, I like to say anymore, I've been around this education business a long time, and it is the most powerful thing I've seen of affecting kids' way of thinking. So it's an exciting program. And we have had some um, conversation with middle school principals as well um, about infusing that learner profile language, you know, throughout to bridge that gap. And I have been part of a team, and I, I don't remember the, all of the members, but we have done a little bit of work with middle school and professional development. Talking, We had some rotations, if you will. So one was learning how they can use the learner profile in their language in their classrooms. And then I don't actually remember what the other rotations, but there has been a little bit of work trying to bridge the, the gap, at least using the vocabulary. Any other questions, Cindy? Dan, you have any? You look like you do. Uh, yeah, just wonder for, for teachers that you would say so-called veteran teachers that have been teaching for quite a while and then adjusting to the, the PYP, has it been a, a real um, rough loop, a complete new mindset for those teachers, or has it been a really big adjustment? It's okay to say yes. Well, I will say, I will say this. Um, I think some of my most improved players, I'll use my sports analogies, are those people who were resistant in the beginning because I like yes. the way I do things. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this for 15 years. It works for me. My, I, I have success. And then, to, and why are you making me do this? And why are you making me fill in all these boxes? To now, and when I say boxes, I mean boxes in a planner. <laughs> um, I have my own lesson plans. I don't need that. To now see those people being a leader of a team, shifting their practices and saying, maybe that wasn't what was best. Maybe I didn't need to give out a packet. Maybe they could create their own model instead of me doing the work for them. I think it's been uncomfortable, and we've honored that and said, you are not the sage on the stage. I, you know, you can say you're your guide on the side. I like to say you're a meddler in the middle because you need to be in the middle of all of that to kind of guide it. And what, when you shift to that, for some people who are used to being the sage on the stage, I'm the giver of everything, that's uncomfortable. And it has taken some people a, a longer time, and some people were just ready for it. And, but I do find that you know, new people coming in, 
they have, they're at a disadvantage because they haven't been here the whole time. But those veteran teachers are strong leaders for them. They support them. And I think our teachers who are new coming in are just like, sure, this is the way we do things. OK, we're ready. So um, it's been really nice for me to reflect about maybe some grumblings I heard in the beginning that now I, I aren't a part of conversations anymore. And Dan, I think to the, just to that point, the beautiful thing is as much reflection as embedded within this framework that now going through the self-study and having to put these slideshows together to submit virtual evidence, I think teachers have been really reflective and been able to see how far they've come since day one. So that's been pretty awesome. If there is no other questions, we'll wrap up um, our meeting today and I'm going to thank our presenters. What a wonderful job. I think um, even myself, every time you speak, I learn something. So um, how much do we know and how much do we own? I kind of felt that a little bit today. How's that? So, um, But yeah, this is very informational and I hope uh, a lot of parents get the opportunity to view this. So thank you very much.